Okay. Well, um, you can see what we got here. We're going to be doing, uh, this is the online, online lecture number 11, and we're talking about paints, coatings, something called zinc-rich paints and anti-fouling. But um, I've got a special guest lecturer here with me today, and um, let's let's see if we can get her on cam. And uh, there, there you go, there you go. She's uh, in the kitchen with me, and uh, so we're gonna kind of we'll pull back here a little bit. Yeah. So here's the. Uh, she's very attentive, very attentive, and here's. Uh, Here's a look at a, a, one of her favorite places, not the sink necessarily, but just the whole place that this is the magic happens. Now she's staring intently and what she sees here, there's uh, some lettuce, there's a banana, and there's some, um, there's some doggy uh, biscuits, doggy cookies as we like to call them. So let's, uh, let's do a little experiment this morning, just to, for a little bit of fun. And um, let's see if, uh, well, we know, we know she, we know she likes uh, dog biscuits. Is that pretty good? Yeah, it's pretty good. Um, let's see if she likes. Uh, let's see if she likes bananas. Fro These are actually frozen bananas. Uh, pretty good dog treat. Maybe some dogs. Surprisingly enough, um, you know, we have to clean our, our palate with a, with a doggy cookie there. And uh, there's the lettuce. I mean, yeah, I, amazing. This dog, this dog likes lettuce. And, oh, oh, I'll get that. I'll get that. Get lettuce dropping out of your mouth. She likes salad. One time I, I, uh, I fed her cabbage, and uh, she thought that was lettuce, but she was a little bit thrown off by, you know, uncooked cabbage, but she, uh, she managed to eat that. She likes corn. She like pretty much likes all vegetables. She doesn't like onions, but she'll, green peppers, maybe, but she'll, she really has very few limitations. Anyway, so this is, uh, you know what? You should go back to bed. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. You're all done. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go. Go. I'm, um, I got more cookies here. I'm going to put these away. Come on, you get out of here. Go back to bed. Go. <laughs> okay, we got we got Grace all settled down. And she's Actually, she's still here looking at me down there on the floor. But we'll, we are going to talk, con continuing to talk about um, coatings today, and that's still part of Chapter 27. And it's still, uh, of course, it's right here. So we talked about corrosion control. And now we're going to talk about anti anti fouling systems, uh, anti fouling anti fouling paint, for instance. I also want to point your attention to this. Now I I posted an announcement last night just to kind of get you a little bit heads up there, and I kind of alluded to this in the previous lecture, and I said well, I was going to kind of we weren't going to do a final exam. You knew well you you we didn't have a whole lot of clarity of how this was going to go and. Uh, but so what I've decided to do, and I've talked to the other profs in, in the department, and uh, we're going to do something. We're going to do a, a, a end of the semester, call it a final drawing pro project. And you're going to be required to do two drawings. All right. So you're only going to have to do two. And I'm not going to do it like you're going to have to, you know, sit there in front of the cam and do it. I'm not going to do that final exam type stuff. I'm going to give you basically... Monday through Thursday of final exam week to do that. I will assign that. Uh, I will assign that. You certainly can be thinking about it because I, I sent you the announcement, but it's not going to be truly assigned as a, a final project until final exam week. And uh, you saw the date. So check out that announcement. And by the way, if I open this up, it says you'll choose which ones you do. Okay. So you're going to be the one, you know, and whether or not it's going to be uh, ship dimensions, you know, like length overall, we had that drawing and uh, uh, length of the water line and uh, length between perpendiculars. That's one of the drawings we did. I've got double bottoms out that, that you can do. I'm going to give you that choice. And I gave you either a fore end or an aft end con uh, construction. 
And so you'll have to, I'm going to give you a list, like choose one of these and choose one of these. And so you can kind of mix and match. Do something. I'm asking you to do it new. Don't give me some old piece that you scan from your notes that looks like you scanned it from your notes. I want it to be new. I want it to be perfect. Yeah, stay with the book, please. And um, here we go. Okay, just me talking. So there's your first slide. And uh, we're going back to this this painting here or this picture of the old Rusty Hulk. And uh, yeah, somebody said, the worst enemies of a ship is, uh, what would you say, time and uh, time and rust, age and rust. Yeah, I, I think that's the worst enemies of a ship. So we're going to continue to talk, talk about uh, coatings. Well, the one thing I want you to remember, no, this is not the one thing I want you to remember, but I want you to write this down. Remember this. Vehicle plus pigment equals paint. And so paint is made up of pretty pretty detailed formula here, right? The vehicle, and you can think of that as the wetness and the pigment, that's the color, that's a very oversimplification, and that's paint. Well, actually, we don't even call it paint anymore. You, you don't you don't paint a ship. Yeah, we talk about what are you gonna do today in maintenance while well, you're painting. You're really applying a coating. You're applying a coating. And uh, they're not so much paint manufacturers, but there are coating, coating manufacturers. Let's look at some. Uh, let's look at some details here. I need to modify this slightly so you can see everything, and that's going to be the best way to do that. I think we'll go kind of like that. So protective coatings, paints, in other words, are intended to obviously protects it against corrosion and to keep the moisture away from the steel. So first of all, let's go down through the bullets. Pigment dispersed in a liquid, which is referred to the vehicle. Okay, we just kind of talked about that. When spread thinly, it creates a protective and adherent dry film. Now, I want you to focus on that phrase there. Protective and adherent dry film. That's twice protective and adherent dry film. I think you know what that means. It's going to show up on exam number three, which, by the way, is coming up next week. Uh, coats the steel, separating it from the atmosphere or the seawater. So under underneath the water, so underneath this, you know, that would be from the seawater or up on deck, it would be separating it from the atmosphere. The vehicle changes by way of either evaporation or it changes, and I kind of put that in quotes there, via a chemical hardening by way of what, a two-part mix. Now, maybe some of you have used two-part epoxy, maybe in fiberglassing, or you've used the resin in the hardener. So I can't really say that it's an evaporation, but it is a change. It's a chemical hardening by a two-part mix. And we know this as an epoxy resin or epoxy paint sometimes or an epoxy coating. There are other types of chemical-based uh, vehicle changes used. There's chlorinated rubber, uh, polyurethane resin, and vinyl resins. But we don't. I'm not going to focus on that. Um, I told you what uh, what I need you to know up here in the upper ones. You know, as we look at a ship. I want you to uh, understand that there are three primary uh, areas. The ship is divided into three coating areas. And there's this top side area, top sides in the hull, superstructure, freeboard, the hull, the decks, the railings, and so all of these things right here. And then let's jump down here to everything below the waterline, and that's going to be anti-fouling paint. And you really can't see this color change here. But this area here is called the boot top, the boot top, an area of intermittent immersion, heavy abrasion by the sea, rubbing up against the docks, tugboats, fuel barges that come alongside. That's that boot top area. So there are three different types of paint. So it's not all one thing. You, know, you kind of probably knew that, but I think that that term boot top and you'll notice that the boot top is usually somehow, usually a slightly different color. So that's kind of interesting. Because the goal is to have a shiny protected boat, right? I mean, here, here's, this is really simple, but a shiny protective boat. 
Now, one of the things I wanted to talk about here is something called zinc coatings. Now, we talked about zincs last lecture, you know, sacrificial anodes. But this is an interesting specialized coating uh, used instead of or in addition to sacrificial anodes. You know, the, those lump pieces of zinc that you attach, bolt, screw on to the side of the ship or underwater portion of the hull. So there's going to be something else here that we're going to use. There are numerous manufacturers within the coating, marine coating business around the world. There are numerous zinc rich paints. Commercially available, of course, and uh, pretty common. And that is to avoid corrosion. That is to avoid corrosion. Now, that zinc is going to be dispersed. It's going to be an electro electrolysis, prevent that electrical cell dividing or, or, or getting to the hull, and the zinc-rich paint will give up first. Now, let's take a pause there. So, kind of using our, our, our whiteboard here, let's just make some notes. Coating, we're talking about zinc-rich paint. Coating should have a high level of uh, zinc dust or powdered zinc as part of the pigment. And uh, actually, I see numbers like a 90%, 90% of that pigment, or there should be able to have a it's hard to explain, but you should have a 90% level. If it, be, if, it, if it goes down below that, if it goes down below that level, it doesn't provide a, a certain amount or the appropriate protection. But that, that zinc-rich paint, that zinc dust, provides the uh, cathodic protection in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, for the ship. Now, the vehicle could be any of the previous mentioned. It could be by a drying process. It could be by an evaporative process. It could be by a chemical change process. Any of those methods would work. It's not any one in particular. But let's just think about for a minute, uh, what I want to ask you is what type of vessels might use zinc coatings? Where would it be really important? Now, I mean, we've all, we, you know, we've talked about something We've talked a lot about expense. We've talked a lot about money. And we know shipping companies are not going to necessarily spend money where they don't have to. And, and uh, sacrificial anodes are very, very good. I mean, they, they, they do the trick really, really well. It is an extra expense to have that ship coated. But what particular reason? Think about a, a, a vessel that would not want to have those lumps on the side and those lumps, by the way, would cause turbulence. And I'm going to give you a clue. It would create a, uh, a, a inability to maintain a certain stealthiness if you were in the water. There's the clue right there. Stealthy. To be stealth-like. To be hidden. And think about, hmm, think about a military vessel. And in particular, think about a, think about a, a submarine. Think about a submarine that doesn't want to be understood where it is. And you don't want to have any exterior turbulence around the hull. And that might be, now I don't know, and you know, I, if, I, if I were to tell you, I'd probably, you know, they'd have to take me out if I told you that. But, but I suspect, I suspect that, you know, that might be a, a really good application. So just a little bit that you can know about. Think about what I just told you there. It would probably be, it's, it's going to be more expensive, but it's, uh, it's possibly might be something like a, uh, like a submarine. It might be a research vessel that was going through the water. Now, uh, you know, when you're, you're doing uh, acoustic surveys and you don't want any of that, uh, background noise. Now, maybe that's it. And the state of Maine, you know, was a hydrographic survey vessel, but, uh, she wasn't in that class of ship that she had zinc-rich paints. Anyway, moving on here. So we want to go on to uh, uh, anti-fouling. So here's a pretty uh, severely, um, severely fouled hull. You can look at the, and you know, I'll, I'll try to remove this picture, and you can see just how, how bad it is. 
So we get the labeling out of there and you can just see the extreme amount. This uh, vessel's in a dry dock. Here's the uh, Here's the uh, the bilge straight right here in this area. You can see the turn of the bilge. Here's the, and up there I can see where it, it kind of ends that we're getting up maybe towards the boot top area. And I can see the blocks under the ship down here in the dry dock. So not a particularly large ship, but awful, awful lot of, uh, awful lot of corrosion in here. So we are talking about anti-fouling paint. So we're talking about the immersed hull and the fittings, various things on, under the hull. You know, the stern frame and then the, 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 the bow thruster and all those fittings and any, any gratings over any intakes for seawater through hull fittings on the bottom of the ship where it would be able to pull in. And, uh, anti-fouling, you know, it's particularly true in, uh, coastal waters because that's where the most growth occurs. You don't necessarily think about this, but you'll see this someday in your life when you go out in the middle of the ocean, the water is incredibly clear. You, you, you would be surprised how deep you could see, and you can't actually tell because there's no reference. But the, the middle of the ocean is kind of like a desert in that there's not a whole lot of stuff going on there. It's when you're in coastal waters that you get more marine growth, both uh, animal and vegetable marine growth. So you got algae, we got barnacles, we got mussels and other shellfish. This growth inhibits the efficiency of the hull and the performance and the hydrodynamic, the uh, hydrodynamic performance of the hull. Let's take another look at the uh, at a ship here. Here's a Maersk ship that's tied up at the dock, and uh, it's floating quite high. We see the bow structure, and what we see here, right on this particular area, this is where I want you to focus. Yeah, you can take a look at the lines and, you know, understand how they're tied up. And, you know, we, we talked about the lines of a ship way back in a few classes ago, like uh, back in Introduction to Naughty Sai. Do anybody remember what this? This is the offshore headline. This is the, this is the uh, uh, onshore headline, another onshore headline coming down. This looks like it might be a breast line. And right there, it looks like we've got a spring line leading aft. Now, those are words that are going to become familiar with you as you get to see. But today, today we want to talk about um, this right here and what's happening here. And I'm going to focus in on something. I want to change that image a little bit. I'm going to zero in on just that particular shot. I want to zoom in. Now, look at that. Boy, what the heck's going on there? Look at this. Um, look at this striping. Now, I think... What I don't, I don't know, but I think this is barnacle growth on the hull. Barnacle growth on the hull. Now, it takes a long time for barnacles to grow. That doesn't just happen overnight. But one of the things that I see, I see this little, like, stripe area back here. Not this one. Oh, I also see this area here, the very front of the bulbous bow. Then I see this striped area here. And then I see this different stripe area back here. Let's talk about all three levels or all three things. First of all, the front of the bulbous bow, that takes an awful lot of wear and tear when the ship's going through the water, and that almost probably wears the barnacles off just because it's right there. You know, it's the blunt end of the bulbous bow. Well, what about this stuff right here, these stripes? Number one, we got number one, two, three, four, five, and then, I don't know, there might even be a couple more here. You know what I think that is? I think when these lines are dropped in the water and when the ship leaves the dock, let me go back here. When the ship leaves the dock, you have to slack this line off. It drops in the water and then it has to be winched up on deck. And I think that the friction of that line is it, as it comes across the bulbous bow, I think that's what scrapes those, um, scrapes those uh, barnacles off. Now, back here in this area, I think is something is different. I think what we're seeing there is the ribs of the ship. I think we're seeing the ribs of the ship. That's where, you know, it's, and then I see that cupping between the, uh, the frames, the ribs, the frames of the ship, a little bit of a cupping, you know, it might be a half inch at those barnacles that, that steel plate is uh, set back in a little bit. And you, you know, you've seen that on the training ship. And when you get the sun just right, you can see that cupping between the frames, particularly on an old ship, an older ship. And uh, that's that's uh, 
Remember that was called that force of the ocean and uh, just the wear and tear on the ship. And that may have been associated with, uh, with the waves hitting the ship and just the stresses involved. Well, that's kind of interesting stuff. So anti-fouling paint. Let's see here. Uh, these coatings, let's see. Pigments uh, and vehicle are mixed with a material which is toxic to marine and vegetable growth. Okay, so uh, the, people figured this out a long, long time, centuries ago, that um, that there was marine growth that was going to da be damaging hulls. You know, back in the days of sailing ships, you know, two or three hundred years ago, and the great warships of the French and the Spanish and the and the uh, the English and on the in the in the Pacific, you know, of the uh, uh, Asian and Chinese and Japanese warships, all of those things, they they determined that in those coastal waters, you know, those those vessels had to be protected. They would actually use uh, copper, thin copper plates, and they would they would they would tack those plates on, nail those plates onto the outside of the ship to provide that protection. They didn't have any other way of doing it because otherwise, you know, there was growth that was going to be uh, would drill itself into the wood, the timbers of the ship, and it would cause uh, damage to that. Well, we don't do that nowadays, but it certainly that's what they did back in the day. Copper was the best known toxin and continues to be traditional used in uh, anti-fouling paints. For effectiveness, that toxin should release from the paint. And here's some key words that I'm going to point out to you. Yeah, I'm going to say them three times at a controlled and known rate. They are going to release from the paint from the coating at a controlled and known rate. One more time, controlled and known rate. What makes it, what makes it all work? Yeah, the toxin, but it all can't come out, if, you know, just two or three months. It has to be done at a known controlled rate. You know, if you're a lobster man on the coast of Maine, you, 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 or maybe you grew up on the coast of Maine, or maybe you know something about this, you know, we haul the boats out in the, in the springtime. Uh, we do it in the springtime because, uh, you know, most of the marine growth is going to happen. It's going to happen when the water gets a little bit warm. So you'll see lobster boats, you know, coming up on the, uh, on the, on the uh, shoreline. And uh, the way the lobster boats are constructed, you can just let them beach right out. And uh, the tide goes down, you apply the paint, and the tide comes back up and off you go. And it will, and it's, it's as simple as that. I mean, there are other ways of doing it. You can go into a shipyard or onto a railway, but an awful lot of fishermen would do it that way. The rate must be to a degree to reach the toxicity level to in inhibit plant or animal growth. AF, which is anti-fouling paint, was previously good for about 12 months. And, and you can still buy anti-fouling paint. That's not, that is the least expensive. Uh, 30 years ago, the industry reached a 24-month protection period. So you only had to apply it once every two years. Nowadays, we, as, we anticipate as much as five years worth of protection. And so that goes into the commercial industry where we're pulling a ship every five years up into the dry dock and, uh, and uh, re-coating the hull. So there's just some facts about it. Coating suppliers have developed something a little bit different. It's called a self-polishing anti-fouling product, which in addition to containing toxins, has a tendency to wear smooth as the vessel goes through the water. Now, you wouldn't think a whole lot of friction could, could uh, you know, between the water and the steel, but, you know, water does, does create some uh, smoothing effect. The smoothing effect, the smoothing actually serves to inhibit marine growth by making it difficult for the, for the little you know, either the little feet of the little shelves or the barnacles or, you know, the attachment point um, or the actual organic growth of, you know, a plant. It's difficult for the growth to attach itself to the hull. It also, it also, because it's a smoother hull, it increases the efficiency, the fuel efficiency. Now, that's kind of interesting, except it goes one step further. There is another class of anti-fouling paint which has no biotoxins at all. It relies completely on the extreme smoothness factor. That's interesting. And a, a notable example of how this happens, a notable example, 
It appears when ships are coated thusly, in other words, it's got this, this class of extreme smoothness, so smooth that, that the, the, the little organisms, whatever they are, you know, animal or plant life, they, they can attach, but they have such a poor attachment. And the ship is in port for a long time, the vessel's in port, and as the growth is there, as long as the vessel's not moving, but as soon as it gets underway, upon getting underway and transiting to what's called sea speed, in other words, it's operational speed, you know, maybe for a big container ship or a tanker, maybe, you know, 13, 14, up to maybe 20, 22 knots. Upon getting up to sea speed, that growth just sloughs off. It falls off because with the water passing by, it just can't get enough grip. So that's interesting, too. Well, I told you a lot about stuff. And uh, listen, uh, we're, we're going to come back and uh, we're going to talk about, we are going to talk about... Um, Let's just go back as I as I finish up just uh, just this talk here now. I'm gonna try to take this. Um, I'm gonna try to take this. Uh, take that out of there. So we got something to look at as I talk. So hey, listen, we got some tests coming up, some projects. I see that I like all but two or three of you, and I know I got one person who's got a legitimate excuse. They call me, and I'm talking about uh, not getting that uh, that uh, uh, report for the Herald of Free Enterprise and the Estonia. Or Tom, I don't know if you know this, but Tom McLean is <laughs> over in Bedham, Maine, not that far from Bangor or Brewer or even Castine, without power as of uh, yesterday. I'm hoping Tom here hearing this, and uh, God, and uh, still without power. So we're, you know, we're coming up on a week without power. There are a few people in Maine, so he's got an excuse. But there was other couple. I think, um, I think you just missed it. I, I don't want to say your name, but your initials are GB. So you guys who missed it, that's one who I remember. So GB, what's up? What's up with that? What's up? Why don't you contact me? Why don't you give me a, give me a good reason for, for that happening, and uh, we'll get that fixed. I'll give you a little bit of break. It's going to cost you a little bit. You don't have an excuse beyond just you just forgot. And uh, we got just a few more lectures coming up. You know, not a whole lot. I think I want to talk about some sea trials and uh, and uh, just a few more things. There's not very many lectures coming up. You know, we got, we got, I'm going to do the exam. And then, by the way, the exam is going to be an open book. It's going to be an open book. Uh, I'm not going to use Respondus for that exam, which is going to be next week. And I'll give you a whole 24-hour period to do it. So uh, watch for information there and so on and so forth. Okay, everybody, talk to you later. Bye-bye.